Good morning. Welcome. Good to see you here on another lovely fall day. Uh, we look forward to hearing another word from Jesus Christ, his parable. Uh, well, kind of a scary one today uh, about what happens at the wedding banquet. And so we look forward to hearing uh, how it is uh, that Christ chooses us. So a lovely and yet also somewhat frightening word today. Uh, if you notice, these little handouts that are in our bulletins, um, the 500th anniversary of the Reformation is on the, well, we'll celebrate it on Sunday the 29th. Uh, in 1517 is when Martin Luther pounded the 95 theses on the door of the Wittenberg Church. Uh, and kind of sent things spiraling out of uh, control for a bit. And now we are here today because of this uh, Reformation movement that Luther started. So uh, each week you get a little taste of it, and there's a lot more on the website uh, if you're interested in that. Many opportunities to share your gifts and your talents and uh, in the way of helping with our uh, Christmas program, a mitten tree. Uh, we're going to be sending some packages to our beloved college students that you can help with. Of course, choir, bell choir, and special music, although I do need to point out that this week, due to MEA, uh, choir will not be practicing on Wednesday. So if you're planning to come to that, uh, don't. Uh, in addition, of course, now uh, November is just around the corner, and we've got some heads up uh, for you to mark a few things on the calendar uh, and join us. And with that, uh, I would like to invite you to please rise as we begin our worship on page 56. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for us, and for his sake forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And uh, our hymn, opening hymn, is on page 551, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. When the day of judgment comes, we have no hope except in your grace given through your Son, Jesus Christ. Make us into the image of Christ. Clothe us for the feast that all of our hope and our joy may be found in your Son, Jesus Christ, alone. Amen. You may be seated uh, as we hear uh, our readings for today. Our first lesson is from Isaiah 25, verses 6 to 9. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wines strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces, 
and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Our psalm is Psalm 23, and we will read it responsibly. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup overflows. Our second lesson is from Philippians 4, verses 4 to 13. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now, at last, you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned for me, but had no opportunity to show it. Now that I am referring to being in need, for I have learned to be content with whatever I have, I know what it is to have little, and I know what it is to have plenty. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being well-fed and of going hungry, of having plenty and of being in need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. According to Matthew, the 22nd chapter. Once more, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again, he sent other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went away, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his slaves, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. Then he said to his slaves, the wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both the good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. 
And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. The word of the Lord. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. With this parable of the wedding banquet, our Lord Jesus Christ has pictured his holy Christian church and his beloved holy gospel. The Lord is expressing his dismay over the contempt shown for his word and the gospel. And he rebukes those who willfully despise it, who persecute and kill those who proclaim the word. Now, the Lord here is portraying his gospel in beautiful, lovely terms, that it's not a time for work or sadness, but... The gospel is a time for festivity and joy. When people dress themselves in their finest, they sing and play and strike up the music, dance, feast, drink, and all around are happy and in good spirits. The Lord describes his Christian church in the gospel in terms of earth's most precious occasion joyous occasion, a wedding. And by this, he teaches us that his gospel is a proclamation of love and joy, a truly joyful celebration where Christ is the bridegroom and the Christian church is the bride. Beautifully, magnificently, the Lord portrays the kingdom of heaven, which we come into through this proclamation of the gospel. It's a wedding banquet to show us the full magnitude of what it's like to come to him in his kingdom to receive his gospel. Now this wedding banquet will be beyond compare, both beautiful and delightful. And in this banquet we will be truly joyful, our hearts and our spirits lifted up in song. And in this way, the Lord seeks to illustrate for us that the holy gospel is the choicest of all treasures and the greatest joy on earth. Now, not only is it a wedding, but a royal wedding, since the bridegroom is the king's son, and everything is most magnificent, elaborate, and regal. Now, how many of you remember the wedding of uh, Prince Charles and Lady Diana? Well, I was 10 years old, and I awoke at, uh, well, I think it was 5 a.m. on a summer morning, to watch the ceremony on television uh, with an estimated 750 million people worldwide. Now, the United Kingdom had declared it a national holiday so that even those who weren't invited were be able to come, uh, well, as if they had been invited. They crowded the streets to catch a glimpse of the procession as the son of an earthly queen was getting married. And those who were invited, well, they came to the banquet. And all who came wore their finest clothes Hats, right? People were fascinated with the amazing hats that the women wore. And millions of others wistfully wished that they could come as well. 
but they had received no invitation and instead they watched from afar. Now, if this is what happens at the wedding of mortal royalty, uh, and even at lesser important weddings, wouldn't we expect this to be true also at the wedding banquet in which God's eternal son is the bridegroom? Wouldn't the masses be storming down the doors to attend? Well, our Lord sends out his messengers to call us because he urgently wants us to come so that we might receive the gospel, which is the forgiveness of sins. This is why he calls his kingdom a royal wedding, to indicate that his gospel is a loving proclamation for hungry and thirsty souls everywhere. In short, this royal wedding is Christ's gracious realm where there is sumptuous food and drink, comforting proclamation, genuine joy, and everlasting bliss. Where the poor sinner finds redemption from death. Where the sorrowful are comforted and there are glad tidings, singing, praising, and giving of thanks. Yet, as Jesus describes here, those called would not come. He first speaks about the Jews who were called over and over again through the prophets, but the invitation was ignored, and worse, the messengers were killed, and even the Son himself was killed. Now this allowed for us I'm assuming here, the Gentiles to also be called then to receive this beautiful gospel promise. But what happens when we Gentiles are called to the wedding banquet? Uh, we're called to receive a simple word, a scrap of bread, a sip of wine, and it's seemingly insignificant for some of us. And when the messenger is sent to call us, we reject and despise it. We will not come. We prefer to tend to our earthly cares and concerns, and we may pay no intention when we are invited by the king to receive so much more. Perhaps we profess that we think what God's doing is really great, but day in and day out, we keep our focus on and place our confidence instead in ourselves. And this is called practical atheism. In our unbelief, we get lost in our vocations as husband and wife, parents, sons, daughters, worker bee of every kind, and we forget the first commandment. I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. And what does this mean? I want to invite my confirmation students to say it, but I won't put them on the spot. We are to fear, love, and trust God above anything else. And so, because our trust is misplaced, then we live lives filled with anxiety and apprehension. Therefore, ensuring that we have earthly security and earthly pleasures that allow us to escape, these then become for us more necessary than partaking in Christ's kingdom. How pitiable it is that we, sinful human beings, you and I, we lay captive in the devil's kingdom, attending to the devil's wedding, 
And we do not want to come to a wedding through which the groom, Christ, wants to rescue us from sin and the power of the devil. Is it not a terrible calamity when we reject the word of life and the proclamation of our salvation, which comes only through hearing and believing that indeed our sin is forgiven. And then we listen instead to the false promises of the devil who tells us that our comfort and our security can be found in earthly things like the accumulation of wealth and power, or alcohol, or shopping, or food, or sex. But this is the mighty power of the devil, who is able to blind us and harden our hearts so completely that people are unwilling to come and listen to the voice, the loving voice of our gracious Heavenly Father and His honey-sweet tongue and mouth. And instead, we prefer the creation to the Creator. Now, those who refuse to listen, who refuse to come to the wedding banquet, who reject the Word, what they don't know is that eventually... Staying on this path, they come to destruction, as Jesus tells us here today. No earthly created thing in the end can save you. If you will not listen to my word, God says, well, then you will listen instead to the devil's word. Now, the greatest sin of all is when Christ's word, in which the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed, that it is despised, and its invitation to his wedding feast is scorned. If one despises the word, God will punish. And he allows then false doctrine and factious spirits to engulf us causing dissension and defection of countless people from God's word as we see happening in our world today. Yet that is not all. There are also those people who come to the wedding banquet, but they aren't wearing the wedding clothes. A terrifying occurrence as when the king sees a man who is not properly outfitted for the wedding, well, it has dire consequences. This is a wedding crasher. And the king asks, how did you get in? Not by the door, he says, because if you had come by the door, if you had come through Christ, you would be properly outfitted for the wedding. You came, he says, instead by another way. As a thief or a robber comes and tries to take what is not given. Because everyone who invited and came by the front door is properly outfitted. The wedding crasher, however, does not know Christ, has not been given the name of the bridegroom, so that he does not know that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So when he's asked, how did you get in here? He's speechless. He does not know the name of Christ. And so the king says, I do not know you. You have not been made righteous through the blood of my son, the bridegroom. And so the king orders him bound, hand and foot, thrown into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And it ends in this final fearsome word. 
For many are called, but few are chosen. It's a terrifying word, isn't it? How do I know if I'm merely called or if I'm also chosen? Well, you who have come here today, you have been called. You've been called to the wedding banquet. You've been called for the banquet of the feast for our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when we look down at ourselves, we don't know, we can't tell, is there a wedding garment? Am I clothed? I can't see it. It isn't apparent to me. Well, and we don't come ourselves properly clothed. We have no ability to manufacture this wedding garment and to clothe ourselves in it. And if it were left up to us, fearfully, there would be an eternal weeping and gnashing of teeth in the outer darkness. But instead, you have been called here today to the door, the proper door, sent a preacher with the word of Christ to clothe you in Christ's own righteousness. What this means then is that you and I, we're utterly dependent upon the Holy Spirit who creates faith when and where the Spirit wishes to clothe you in Christ's own righteousness. Now I invite you to hear this, the very word of Christ. Your sin is forgiven through the blood of the lamb, the royal son, the bridegroom. Jesus Christ has now given you his own wedding robe. He was made naked and hung on a cross that you may be clothed in his own robe of righteousness. The bridegroom took your place, for it was Christ who was bound hand and foot, and it was he who was thrown out into the outer darkness for your sake. It is Christ who wept and gnashed his teeth that you may now rejoice and sing at the wedding banquet. You are now clothed in Christ, given his name to call upon in time of need, set free from God's wrath and judgment. So now through Christ you have a gracious Father and a faithful redeemer who rescues you from eternal death and the devil. You are a child of everlasting life. You are chosen. Amen.
Good morning. Each year, uh, it has been a tradition that we present a catechism to the first graders. So they receive their first catechism as they start learning the different uh, memorization things out of the catechism. As I call your name, please come forward and Jesse, our Sunday School Superintendent, will hand it to you. Molly Jacobs. Bobby Tim. Allie Trapp. And Bentley went. They will also be presented at the second service, so the two that are missing may be at that service. Thank you. I invite you to please rise as together we declare our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed found on page 65. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. In the power of the Holy Spirit, let us pray to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for the world, the church, and all people according to their need. O Lord, our, O God, our Lord and King, you have made the church the bride of your beloved Son. Make it radiant with faithfulness and lovely with holiness. Adorn its words and deeds with such grace that through them many may hear your call and gladly partake of your wedding banquet of salvation. Lord, in your mercy. Save our world and its people from natural disasters and from every, every human malice. Take away the reproach of our sins and the death shrouds of the evils that beset us. Give us leaders who are wise, honorable, just, and excellent. And give to each of us the blessing of your peace. Lord, in your mercy. We lift before you the needs of all who walk through the valley of death, and all who are troubled by sorrow, anxiety, or despair. Especially we pray for Mike Rogotsky, Connie Knutson, Danny Knackreiner, Clarice Trebish, and Linus Wenthold. Revive their souls, restore their bodies, and refresh the hearts of all who care for them. Lord, in your mercy. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the lives of your faithful servants who have entered the banquet hall of eternal life with you. We give thanks especially for Glenn Erickson. Keep us steadfast in faith as well. Grant us the greatest joy of all, the joy and privilege of sitting with all your wedding guests at the banquet table you have prepared for those whom you have wedded to Christ forever. Lord, in your mercy, all of this we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. You may be seated as we receive our offering.
Merciful Father, we offer with joy and thanksgiving what you have first given us, ourselves, our time, and our possessions, signs of your gracious love. Receive them for the sake of him who offered himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Holy Father, through Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection, opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending he was betrayed our Lord Jesus took bread broke it gave it to his disciples saying take and eat this is my body given for you do this for the remembrance of me again after supper he took the cup gave thanks and gave it for all to drink saying this cup is the New Testament in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin do this for the remembrance of me and now, gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray the beautiful prayer that our Lord Jesus has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Come to the banquet, all is ready.
I invite you to please rise as you are able. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Let us pray. We give you thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through the healing power of this gift of life, clothing us in the righteousness of Christ. And we pray that in your mercy you would strengthen us through this gift in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. For the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Receive now this blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you his peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. I'd like to dismiss any Sunday school teachers and Sunday school kids. And for the rest of us, we will sing our closing hymn. 221, send forth by God's blessing. Mm -hmm.